Well, now that we've opened up the economy to lockdown level two, some sectors are proving hard to manage safely and profitably, given the inherent weaknesses of certain sectors and the commitment to ensuring safety standards are implemented by all parties. To take a look at this economic reality and how it impacts on things like job losses, as well as public health and safety, I'm joined by economist Dr. Neva Macheta. Neva, thank you so very much. Uh, we've seen over the last few days a lot of sectors opening up, obviously as a consequence of the regulations being relaxed. Uh, but there are sectors that proves to be very difficult to do so profitably and safely. Uh, you've brought out what is called a TIPS tracker. Uh, take us through some of the key issues um, regarding the sectors that are difficult to open, um, you know, where people's safety is um, taken uh, very seriously. Um, and, of course, profitability isn't something that, that you can do given the circumstances. Yeah, look, I'm sorry, there was some interference there and I missed some of the question, but I think the real issue is that there's two kinds of industries that, find, that need to develop new models. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think part of the problem is we all think opening up means we go back to December 2019, but that's not possible. And the two sets of industries that are in trouble are the ones that directly serve the public, and particularly inside in large numbers, and the other one is where workers are working together inside in large numbers, close by each other. And especially when it's loud, because then people tend to shout more. Okay. And so, so I think what we need to say is we need to be, if they want to be open and be profitable, they need to be extremely innovative. And we can't just think we, we're just somehow, we just hold on, we go back to 2019 in less than six months to a year. Okay, so one of the sectors that have been uh, hit is, of course, um, your restaurants, your hospitality industries. And we've uh, seen the stories of, you know, the restaurant industry, waiters and other people. But the very nature of how a kitchen is organized, Neva, means that people have to work very closely together. Um, you're also talking about where do workers who work in those sectors go when they have to have lunch? Do they sit in a crowded uh, cafeteria where you can't really practice social distancing? Um, are you speaking about those kinds of sectors, which of course includes uh, and employs large amounts of people in South Africa? Um, do you see any indication that those sectors are actually grappling with the real changes that needs to happen at the workplace and that they need to institute those changes if they are going to be sustainable over the long term? Just to be clear, I think that where it's about serving the public, it's often the public that's at risk. So it turns out studies show retail's not so bad, but in the U.S., 9% of all infections are caught in bars. Mm. And I think that the real issue is if you're inside all breathing the same air, even if it's not too dense, you can catch it. That's the recent research. So I think there's that issue for consumers and public service in personal services and in restaurants where you're spending some time together, it's risky. And the part of the problem has been everywhere in the world. It's not just the restrictions by the state. It's that people don't want to go there because they see the risk. Yeah. So to me, the issue is how do we think about that? Similarly for international tourism. You know, the recovery has been far slower in the Western Cape than in the rest of the country economically, according to a bunch of indicators. And I think part of that is just because they depend a lot on international tourism and there are not going to be, even if we were to open up the international flights, how many people want to get on a long haul flight for, you know, eight to 10 hours to go on vacation when they can go to the Mediterranean coming from some of these high income markets. So the thing that I would really flag is more that we all of us need to be innovative and we need to be realistic and we need to stop pretending that it's just about government restrictions. And when those go away, everything will be fine. Now, and the other thing is, no, please continue, Neva. No, just to say that one of the issues around getting rid of restrictions is, you know, I think governments have been very good this time about saying to people, the risk is still there, you need to change your behavior. But the mere fact of getting rid of restrictions, people tend to hear it as, oh, it's safer. Hmm. It's not actually safer. The level of new infections is down. But according to, for instance, there's an index put out by, the, by Harvard institutions they would say we're still in a yellow zone. We still have, a, you know, the level of new infections is still three times as high as it was during level four. So there's still a significant risk. And the fact they've gotten rid of the restrictions doesn't mean it's safe to do all of these things the way we used to.
Now, the, 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 the one thing that we the one thing that we need to, of course, um, look at, and you've said this, um, you know, government has been good in reminding people that the risks are still very high, and even though the economy is open, you know, people are um, at risk if they don't practice, um, you know, the rules. Has business internalised this, and have um, you know people um, who are in organised formations like trade unions have they internalised this? I mean. We've seen, for example, Nihal um, really complaining about the quality of the PPE, the availability of the PPE. I believe they're going to have a picket um, and potentially a full-on strike uh, because they're so unhappy. Have those um, uh, social partners actually internalized what they have to do to ensure that these spaces are um, you know, safe uh, for people to return to? You know, I think the problem is this. You know, it, the, the unions mostly have because their workers are at risk. But I do think, that, to be blunt, the real problem, I think, tends to be small business because they don't have the resources to do the infection prevention as easily. So it's much harder for them to say, you know, we'll only have 50 percent capacity, everybody wears masks, we'll do the disinfection, all of those things. They're expensive and they're hard. And then their profits go down and that's their livelihood very directly. So. To me, it's more about how do we provide support, firstly, to industries that may never come back with the same levels of employment, or at least not for two or three years, and secondly, for businesses that really have high costs that are new and our demand has fallen because household incomes are down and people are scared to go out. And then there are restrictions that are needed to prevent infection. And I think we need to face up to those and say, how do we ensure that there isn't a, an even worse decline and that we lose even more of our very limited small business as a result. And the one thing I want to flag is I do think this is where solidarity becomes important. That one thing is, you know, when you say the GDP drops by 7 percent, that puts a burden on everybody who is actually relatively protected to say, how do we ensure that the burden is not borne by low income households, by workers who lose their jobs, by small businesses going broke? And that we need to think about those basically redistributive measures to ensure we don't have what they call a K-shaped recovery, where the rich are able to protect themselves and the poor lose out, because that would be socially and politically unsustainable. Absolutely. Now, very recently, in fact, when the president announced the regulation, um, you know, um, that is going to be relaxed, um, he also said that um, they are going to be coming up with a new economic plan. Uh, some analysts have said that this just introduces more uncertainty because we need, um, you know, people to make what we have work. We don't need uh, new uh, plans at this stage. Uh, given what you're saying, Neva, that we are not actually internalizing that we need different models. Um, how important is this process that the president is speaking on and how quickly should this plan be tabled? Yeah, look, I think it doesn't look. The plan can also be to say, how do we tweak existing programs? I don't think it's about saying everything is wrong. It's about saying there are new realities. I will say that my concern about the planning process is it's easy for all of us to say, once the pandemic is controlled, how do we go forward? And then we all tend to fall back on what we've been saying anyways. But what do we do before the pandemic is truly controlled? And how do we manage that process to ensure what they call a just transition so that it's not working people and the poor who bear the burden of the costs? Because there will be costs. You know, even if we get a vaccine discovered in the next six to nine months, the chances that it will get to South Africa on a large scale before the middle of next year seems fairly slim. There are ways of controlling the virus that require behavioral change, but those are precisely the behavioral changes that make things like restaurants and bars hard to, ma hard to manage. All and right, Nina, we've, the cost we've, run, like we've run out of time. You've raised some very interesting points. Of course, uh, we will be taking that forward here on The Fix. Well, you've had your fix for the week. See you again next Sunday. Thank you so much for watching.